Hello, my name is Takaya Blaney. I am 12 years old, and I am from the Slime Nation. Um, my ancestral name that was given to me by my kukba, my grandfather, in, as we say in the Slime language, is Chekajimu, and that was a name that was passed down through generations, and it was the name of someone who helped a lot of people. Um, Slyamon is located on the coast of British Columbia, five hours north of Vancouver. So by saying that our, our nation is part of the, the Coast Salish nations, meaning half of our culture is, is really water and everything around water, that's, that's, where, that's where we, that's how, that's how we live. It's, it's the ocean, it's our, it's our streams, it's the cedar. Um, so I was, I was able to grow up, and I'm still growing up, but grow up from the time that I was a, a baby to now, beside the ocean and, you know, the, the forest, that was my TV and swimming and that was, that was my playground, <laughs> like you said, that was, you know, the forest, that was my playground. And it was just... I was able to be around a lush, beautiful environment where it still existed. At the same time as I was able to um, experience my culture, I was also able to understand that there was so much of our culture that was lost or we cannot practice anymore because of the lack of food and the lack of environment and healthy ecosystems. When you're at the young age, under the age of five and six and seven, that's when you absorb the most because that's when you, that's when you really learn. You are oblivious to some things to an extent, but at the same time you're, you're absorbing in the emotion behind a word, what's this word directed at? So I was also able to realize what was wrong in my community. Um, we're divided through the treaty process right now and how, and how our environment was being destroyed. Our old village was called Tishusum, and that means place of the spawning herring. We were forced out of those lands and now we're on to where we are now, um, Simon Reservation, but there are no more herring there. So I had doubts about the future, even as a child of five and six and seven. I had doubts and thoughts from seeing a polluted land and seeing and hearing about a land that was once lush and filled with life that my kukba, my grandfather, and my chichi, and my grandmother told me about and how when the tide was out, the table was set because it was that pristine. That's what, that's what they said. Um, and that same beach that my, that my father, that my, my kukba and chichia, that they practiced their culture on without any restrictions and without any little voice in the back of their head saying, will I get sick from drinking this, from eating this? Can I possibly die from drinking this and eating this? And now, it's more than a voice in the back of your head. There are signs all over saying that. So, all of those doubts from experiencing that and not being able to experience my culture as a very, very young child that is it's passed down through generations and that portion of it that's being blocked from being passed down to the next generations because of restrictions and land and um, unhealthy ecosystems. I, I had doubts. I was thinking, well, even the most common thing, such as seeing birds fly by, will that exist? Will that exist? Even as a child of five and six and seven, that's what I thought. Because I noticed those things. And it wasn't... It wasn't until I was eight years old, I was in grade three, that I stumbled upon a newspaper article. And this newspaper article 
was describing the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, and the Northern Gateway Pipeline is a twin pipeline carrying crude oil from the tar sands to Kitimat, and that's along the coast, the northern coast of BC, and from there on super tankers, the, the loudest ships on earth, down to California and to China. And when I saw that, it's just all of those doubts and all of those worries and remembering when, um, when I asked what this word means in slam and, and my mother replied, well, nobody really knows, looking at a street name. And just experiencing that and those doubts that came from that and those worries, they just came flooding in as I read that article. Before, before I read that article, fixing my community and restoring that, that puzzle piece that's been missing from our community because, because of the violation of our rights and our culture and our land. That was always something that I really wanted to do, even as a very young child, but it was always along the lines of when I grow up. When I grow up, maybe I'm going to fix my community. And it was very, very distant for me. I wanted to do something, but it was just, well, I have to be over 18 or something, or else no one's going to listen to me. I have to be grown up. So it was just very distant. But once I read this, I realized I don't have time to grow up. I don't have time to just keep waiting, waiting for the next day and the day after that. Our world is rapidly changing and it's unraveling and we're watching it all around us. It's a world that we live in today and if you really want to change something and if you want to make an impact on the future, you have to be, you have to be doing that today. I recently wrote a song and that was called Earth Revolution and in the lyrics it says, there won't be tomorrow if we don't change today. And that's when I realized it, is when I was grade three, I was eight years old, and at that moment, I just thought, I want to do something. So from there, I decided to write a song, and the song was, is called Shallow Waters. And Shallow Waters is about a future where that oil, where it spills from the Northern Gateway Pipeline and across the pipeline that's going across 40, over 45 different First Nations territories and those cultures and that, that way of life. Where it spills and where it spills from those tankers that would affect the whales and the ecosystems that the Coast Salish people, we all depend on. And it's reminding people that this isn't the future that we want for the many generations to come. You know, I hear, I hear a lot of people today saying, I heard that there won't be fresh drinking water and clean water in a thousand years. Not my problem. And that's what I hear all the time. But it'll be our problem. It'll be the next generation's problem. We're handing down a land that is destroyed by corporations, that is destroyed by greed. It's destroyed by money. And for the need of a small plastic fan that you don't actually need in your house. It looks cool, whatever, it's destroying the planet. It's destroying our people. It's. It's because of those small little plastic and irrelevant things in our lives and those, this oil and these lies that our, our entire way of life is just being destroyed. And so it's, do I want to, do I want to live in the future by the time that I'm an elder? 
Do I want to live in a future where there's no clean drinking water? Do I want to live in a future where our culture can't be passed down because of, of the land, because the land is polluted? Today, we worry about so many things. Our families, we, worried about, we worry about each other. We worry about money, we worry about all of, all of these things, but if we keep traveling on the path that we are on right now, think of what the families of 2113 might have to worry about. They'll, they might have to worry about breathing. Is it healthy to breathe? That's what our, our, our people might be facing in the near future. So realizing this um, and writing this song about shallow waters, it was just one of those things where it's just um, you, you get inspired by something that you read, something that you hear. And if you like to write, if you like to write short stories or poems, or if you're a songwriter, you put all of your emotions and all, your, all of your thoughts into that song. And 20 years, 20 years from that, you look back at that and you're like, oh yeah, I was really concerned about that. I really didn't like that. And that's what I thought it would be. But it turned into something much more. It was entered into the David Suzuki songwriting contest for the planet, and it's, an, it's a national environmental songwriting contest, and it reached the semifinals, and um, it gained some publicity because of Ian Summerhalder. Um, he's from the Vampire Diaries, and um, he, put it on his, he put it on his blog, so a lot of people were watching, were watching that because of that. So I started to get in these comments under the music video, and they were saying, oh, I love Ian Summerholder, ah, oh, Ian Summerholder. And I was like, what's this? So you know, I, I found out about that, and I have, I have, I have him to thank because of um, some of the numbers of that, the views. So thank you for that. Um, but from there, I decided to use my voice more than my singing voice, but my speaking voice as well. And the first thing I did once Shallow Waters got recorded is I went down to the Bentall Building, Enbridge Headquarters in Vancouver, and I went, um, I went with Greenpeace. They called in advance and they said, okay, this 10-year-old this is going to be coming to your office and she's going to hopefully be able to speak to you. And I had, um, I had wrote an open letter to politicians and especially aimed at Enbridge and to the Enbridge Corporation. And because of this, they had posted security guards outside of the building. So we, we drove past and I got out of the car and I marched up there with my, with my open letter and my CD and I got about five feet into the building before a security guard said, I'm sorry, I can't let you go farther than this point. So I decided, well, I can just record what I want to say. Um, a reporter, a First Nations reporter, Angela Starrett, she was there and she had her um, recorder, I don't know the proper word for it. And so she recorded me saying what I wanted to say to Enbridge and halfway through the security guard stopped us and said, I'm sorry, if you don't leave now, I'm going to have to charge you for trespassing. Didn't say that to Greenpeace, didn't say that to the reporters, he said that to me. <laughs> it's just, it really showed me as a first step that how unafraid we are of these corporations and our people are of Facing, facing these corporations and actually standing up and how afraid they are of that movement that we will, that we will make, such as I don't know more. We've said numerous times that we have had enough and standing up in this huge movement, such as I don't know more, that turned global, it's really showing 
our resilience and showing how unafraid we are in the face of these threats and the corporations and the government, the government which is a puppet to these corporations. And you know, they'll, they'll do whatever means necessary. They'll bring in the military to these, these countries and to these nations that are trying to fight for their own lives and trying to fight for the, the lives of their force and of their, their territory. And they'll bring in the military. They'll use whatever means possible. And here you have our people who are unafraid in the face of that. And that was just so inspiring to me to be able to see that. Before I started speaking, I was very scared of standing up with a microphone and saying hello. I would sing, I would sing at powwows, um, I would sing Amazing Grace in my language that was translated um, by my kukba, my grandfather, and my chichi, my grandmother. But I was just so afraid to actually use the voice that the creator gave me. But once I started with my activism, I realized, well, it isn't, it isn't about saying hi, and it isn't about singing anymore. It's about my people, it's about our people, it's about the entire world. It's... <laughs> it's about, and more than that, uh, it's about our Mother Earth and about trying to heal our dying mother and standing up and stepping up for her and that has nothing to do with me as an individual. It has to do with indigenous people and it has to do with my generation and it has to do with Mother Earth and I shouldn't, I shouldn't be embarrassed and I shouldn't be afraid, afraid of that because that's what needs to get done. So I got, I got over that, I got over that. Um, before I started speaking, I was, hi. I'm gonna sing now. But now I'm standing here and I'm speaking, speaking to you guys on behalf of my people, the slime and people um, who are facing injustices from, that we're receiving from the government and also within our community with corruption, with fraud. Um, that's coming from the treaty process, the modern day treaty process with the government. So I'm standing here today and it's, it's just, over the years that I have traveled, um, one of the first, yeah, the first UN conference I, I went to was in Bandung, Indonesia. And that was the Tenza UN Children and Youth Conference on the Environment. And it was there I was able to see hundreds and thousands of kids from all over the world in their traditional dress. Children from Africa, from, from Asia, from North America, all over that were just as passionate as I was about healing the world and healing the people and saving humanity from itself. And just as passionate. And it's, it's as inspiring as it is tragic that us young people have to actually go up to our leaders and tell them, you're not leading on behalf of us. You're not leading on behalf of your own children or us indigenous people. You're leading to line the corporation's pockets with money. And it's inspiring to see that, to see kids who were younger than myself. I was 10 at the time, younger than myself, going up to politicians, going up to CEOs and saying, no, I traveled all the way from my country you're, you're killing the land, um, the pollution is killing my people. No, and it was just so inspiring to see that. I, because of that youth movement that I was, I was starting to notice and starting to notice kids who were coming up to me when I was speaking and they were saying, what can I do? 
Um, I mean, you're, you're able to, to go up and speak about these issues, but I, I don't know how to, how can I make a difference? And it's, it's a question that I even ask myself. It's, you have what you want to do, and that's in your mind. It's in your mind, it's in your heart. But you just don't know how to achieve those things. Where do I start? And that's a question that you constantly get asked or you constantly ask yourself. And that, that isn't just with activism, it's really with anything. It's, so I mean, they come up to me and they, they ask me, well, I, I don't know if I can really do anything. No one's gonna listen to me, I'm just a kid. In, in our culture, it's, it's uh, what we pass down through generations to generation and from the, it's a, it's a part of our culture that has been there and this teaching that has been there from the time of our ancestors' ancestors that the creator gave us a voice for a reason. That the creator gave humans a voice we have a language for a reason. We can speak to each other for a reason. We have a lot of power. We have a lot of power. And the reason that we have a voice is to speak for those who don't have a voice. That's our purpose. That's our purpose on earth is to be stewards of the land and to take care of that land and use our voice. I can speak. Can you speak? Yes. You can. Yes, you can, so use that voice. And that's, you know, follow your own path, and that's really what you, that's really the first step, is just use your voice. It may seem hard, but it's as simple as that. Just use your voice. Over the years, um, when I, from when I started speaking um, to now, the second song that I came out with was Earth Revolution. And Earth Revolution is about, it's about the rights of Mother Earth. It's about the rights of indigenous people that is being undermined. And, and most importantly, it's about Mother Earth and as well, it's about children. It's about my generation. I went to the UN conference in Rio, and it's every decade. It's once a decade. And it was called Rio Plus 20. And this is where world leaders got together, and the representatives of those world leaders, they all got together in this one place in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. And they talked about creating a sustainable future. This sounded, hearing about this, it just sounded like something like, really, this is actually happening? So I fundraised to go there, but actually attending the conference, it was quite disappointing for me. It was all talk, no action. It was really, yeah, it was, it was just that. We're gonna make a game plan for the next thousand years, 100 years, we're going to make the first step. And in the next hundred years, we're going to make the second step. And it was just like, well, we don't have time for that. I was told by a woman that we only have time for two things now, action and prayers. And that's really true. We don't have time to talk anymore. We've been talking for the last century. And now, more than ever, is the time to act. The outcome of Rio de Janeiro was promoting, um, it was promoting, it was promoting REDS. And REDS is, it's a carbon credit buyout program 
So basically, a corporation that has destroyed the land, um, it, it, to, to take that carbon that it's emitted and like, put it back into the, the environment, they buy up areas of land and they, especially in the, the Amazon rainforest, and if there is people on that land, they force them out of their own territory. Um, they own the water, they own the, the air, they own the forest in this program, and in most cases, they cut down that rainforest, and they replace those trees with genetically modified trees to inhale more carbon. That was the outcome of Rio Plus 20. It was promoting what they call the green economy, which is exactly, exactly greed economy. The greed economy. It's, that's what the outcome of Rio Plus 20, the once a decade conference was. A lot of people like me were very disappointed with this outcome. So what we did was in the main hall, we had this rally. And there were so many people there. And what I did was I got up on the table, and we were doing a mic check. So basically, it's like you, you say a sentence, and then the entire crowd, they repeat that sentence. So you don't need a mic. It's a, it's a, mic. It's a human mic. That's what the concept of it is. And so what I said was that the corporations and the companies that are mining and that are developing and that are destroying our Mother Earth, that are killing our Mother Earth, that are, that are polluting her, they won't be here forever. And they'll have to hand down that land to my generation, to the next generation. They'll have to give that land back to our people and what will they give us? What will they give us? Land full of pipelines? An ocean that was once full of whales, starfish, and our food, that's our, our food that we, that we eat and that my ancestors have eaten. Will they hand us back that ocean empty, empty of life? that beautiful, beautiful life? Will they hand, hand down a land to my generation that has been cleared of mountains, that have been turned into nothing because of mining? What will they give our people? My people, They've been selling their rights, their indigenous rights, their water rights, because of that money. There's not a lot of education. It's through the treaty process of what this is. And you just have to ask yourself, what will they give, what will these corporations give us back once we've signed away these rights and these, this jurisdiction over our land? And when the corporations come in, they do whatever they want. We don't have any jurisdiction anymore. What will they give our people? What the, will they give our generation? The next generation, the children that are unborn yet, what will they grow up in? There are so many things today that I wish my ancestors and the people in the past that they changed and that the past went differently. But if you think about it, we're the ancestors for the many generations to come. And I don't want that generation to be thinking, I wish my ancestors did something. So that's what Earth Revolution is about. It's about my generation speaking up for that land. More than just chasing the dream of a sustainable future, chasing our own future. Because we won't have one if we, if, we don't chase, if we don't chase that future. 
So I'm going to sing Earth Revolution. Um, and, you know, listen to, the, listen to the lyrics and listen to the message, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Okay, um... So this song... Oh, yay, it's here! Okay. <laughs> yes. Up from a distance Still got a million miles to go Making a difference The only trophy I want to hold The state of the nations It's poison from pollution, greed and war We know we have solutions But actions speak louder than words Oh, stop waiting till tomorrow Oh, stop living yesterday Oh, cause there won't be tomorrow If we don't change today, we generation now, children of the future, Earth revolution. Creation's crying out, and I feel her pain. I can't walk away, so I will do my part to fix what's broken and give. What we've taken hope for the dawn of a new day Calling out to each and every person Join me in the earth revolution Ooh, oh, oh, oh. Let's go the distance We are a million voices strong Facing resistance But there's a choice between right and wrong Whoa. Stop waiting until tomorrow oh, Stop living yesterday There won't be tomorrow Whoa. If we don't change today We're generation now Children of the future Earth revolution Creation's crying out I can't walk away So I will do my part to fix what's broken Give back what we've taken and hope For the dawn of a new day Calling out to each and every person Join me in the earth revolution And I want this great land It used to be beautiful It used to be whole And I've seen the river run dry Now communities have no hope Where are the tall ancient trees They replace them with their concrete trees We gotta turn this around we can fix it right now 
For generation now, children of the future, Earth revolution. Creation's crying out, I feel her pain, I can't walk away. So I will do my part to fix what's broken and give back what we've taken. Hope for the dawn of a new day. Calling out to each and every person, join me in the Earth Revolution. I'm calling out to every generation, join me in Earth Revolution. Ooh, oh, oh. When I, um, when I sang that song and when I talked about the land that was going to be hand down or the land that wasn't going to be hand down to my generation in the rally in Rio Plus 20, at first I started to see dozens of security guards surrounding our little, our little area where we were vocal and then you started to see helicopters flying above your head. And then you started to see the military. It's, again, what I said before. We are, we are fearless. Our people were, were willing to rise up no matter what that's going to cost, if it's going to put your career on the line or if it's going to put your life in the line. And it's more powerful to say that you're willing to live and dedicate your life to a cause than you're willing to die for a cause because that's more powerful to really dedicate your life to saving something. And that's what, us, that's what our people have been doing and that's what, we're, that's what we are doing and these corporations they're bringing in the military. And these, this event was bringing in the military and the security because of a message that the entire conference was supposedly about. I don't want you to say that even though our entire conference was supposed to be about that. They were trying to silence us. Um, and we aren't afraid. And it may seem at some times that you're probably not going to make a difference and that you're just one person out of seven billion. But to count to a million, you always have to start with a number one. There's always a lonely one, but then there's two and three and four and five. And eventually the number grows into a million and more. And that's what you always have to remember, that you're never alone, because you always have support. And you have, you have a voice, and don't be afraid to use that voice. And every one of you in this room has a passion, has a gift, something that they want to do. And that gift was given to you by the Creator. Share it. Share that gift. Thank you.